Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to Prog Chattery 777. So I'm going to be talking about another band, make another little playlist for you guys. Um, I'm going to be talking about another Canadian band from the 1970s by the name of Max Webster. Now my apologies to my viewers in the United States and in the UK, because you may not be totally familiar with Max Webster, because tragically, uh, they never quite achieved a huge amount of success outside of Canada, which I think is... Criminally unjust. I think Max Webster is actually probably one of the single most underrated and underappreciated 70s rock bands. They're absolutely phenomenal, and I could never really understand why they didn't, you know, have that opportunity to leap out into the world and share with everybody their great sound. Um, but there are reasons for it, which we'll talk about uh, as we go along. Uh, so between the years of 1976 and 1980, uh, Max Webster released uh, five fantastic studio albums and one live album. Um, and uh, during that time, they toured a lot throughout Canada. They toured a little bit through the States and a little bit uh, in Europe, uh, typically with Rush, actually. Um, Rush and Max were quite close in the 70s, which is kind of a blessing and a curse for Max Webster. Um, you know, Rush would, when Rush was touring the States in uh, the late 70s, they'd bring Max along as an opening act, and same with Europe. I think there was one or two times that Max made it over to Europe. Um, uh, but again, that's stuff that we'll, we'll get into greater detail as we, as we talk about the albums. Um, the Max's sound uh, is, is, is a very unique thing, you know. I wouldn't go as far as to say that Max Webster is a progressive rock band, although they have those progressive elements. Uh, in, in fact, you know, they, they, they brought all kinds of different elements into their albums to create a sort of melting pot of all kinds of eclectic things. Uh, like I said, there's a proggy element, you know, there's some, a lot of their albums would contain at least one kind of like, slightly extended song. They never made, made any ten minute epics or anything like that, but they would do epic type songs. Um, there's also a great, a, a few, you know, great little pop songs, very melodic songs. They also did, um, a few folky songs, and there's some outright bizarre songs they did as well. You know, they're incredibly quirky, uh, which is not a word that you hear too often, you know, at least at that time period for bands in, um, in, uh, Canada and North America. A lot of quirky English bands, but, um, you know, a North American quirkiness was kind of harder to find. I think Max Webster really hit the nail on the head. They've got some very unique songs. Um... And I mean, unique songs and in unique albums. That's why I think Max Webster is so underrated, is because they really don't sound like anybody else. You, know, you can tell they're influenced by you know stuff like the Beatles and whatnot, but um, you know I, I can't think of any other band that sounds like Max Webster. Um, they had numerous lineup changes as they went along, uh, but they always had the um, the core lineup, which uh, included Kim Mitchell on lead vocals and guitar, Terry Watkinson, um, who is the keyboard player, synth player. Uh, and they're really the two key sound sources in the band, is Mitchell's guitar and Watkinson's keyboards, and it's that counterpoint and that balance between those two sounds that gives Max its, uh, its awesomeness. Uh, but they also had a chap named uh, Mike Tilka on bass. Uh, he was replaced by Dave Miles halfway through, and um, the longest-serving drummer was a chap named Gary McCracken, uh, who replaced a guy named Paul Kersey. Um, so that's kind of like the basic sound setup of the band. Uh, but very importantly, they also had a fifth unseen member by the name of Pai Dubois, and he was responsible for almost all of their lyrics. And uh, the lyrics are a big part of what makes Max Webster so great. I don't know any other lyricist quite like Pai Dubois. He's very, his words are very surreal and abstract and just bizarre at times. Uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you try and... If you, if you take a look at some Pai Dubois lyrics from Max Webster or whatever, and you try and, you know sort some sort of reason out of it, then you're just gonna, you're just gonna hurt your head. Uh, but it's, it's funny, because he's got this great way of, of, of saying things that sound very profound, but they're still very irreverent and bizarre as well. Uh, he's certainly one of my favorite lyricists. I am a big fan of Pai Dubois' lyrics. Um, and obviously, he had a connection with Rush as well, because he co-wrote uh, several Rush lyrics with Neil Peart. Uh, he did co-write um, Tom Sawyer, Force 10, uh, between Sun and Moon and Tess for Echo. I think there's four songs that Pai Dubois collaborated with Neil Peart and Rush. So there's a, there's a bit of a Rush connection, but with Max Webster, he was predominantly their lyricist. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's a big factor of what makes Max Webster so great. So it's all about the guitar, the keyboards, and the crazy lyrics. And then that's all backed up by the uh, strong and mighty rhythm section. 
so yeah, that's uh, that's the that is the my next modus operandi. I'll be talking about um, the Max Webster albums, and it, it makes sense because, like I said, they were quite close with Rush in the late '70s, and um, yeah, it just makes sense that I'd release my Max Webster videos alongside my Rush videos. So uh, hopefully that's cool with you guys. Um, and yeah, just well, just about to wrap the video up. Just to, just to kind of like put a little theory as to why Max didn't quite make it outside of Canada. I think it's the blessing and the curse of being so tight with Rush. Uh, as I mentioned, they were touring buddies, so like when whenever uh, Rush was out touring in the United States or in Europe, occasionally they'd bring Max Webster out as the opening act. And that would have been a great show to see, Max Webster and Rush in the 70s. That would have been just fantastic. Um, but uh, they were also label mates. Rush and uh, Max Webster were both signed to Anthem Records. And I think this is really where the problems kind of started that eventually led to Max Webster's demise um, is the fact that I think the record label, because Rush was achieving so much success in the late 70s and they had broke broken internationally and they were able to tour all over the place, uh, I think the label just simply invested way more time, effort, energy, and money into Rush and they kind of neglected Max Webster and, uh, you know, the band just kind of got sick and tired of being, you know, second to Rush all the time. So I think eventually that has some something to do with why they dissolved. I don't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't even born. But uh, from what my research has concluded, I think that has a lot to do with it. So um, if that is true, shame on you, Anthem Records. You should have you should have invested more into Max Webster, and then you'd have two epic Canadian bands touring internationally. Because I'm I'm sure Max Webster could have broken internationally. I'm sure of it. They did have a couple of hits in the UK, minor hits. So I'm interested actually if, if my UK viewers are familiar with Max Webster or if they saw Max Webster open for Rush back in the 70s. Uh, we'll see as the videos go along. So um, anyway. Stay tuned for more Max Webster videos. Thank you very much for watching. If you like, like. <laughs> uh, don't forget to comment and subscribe and all that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for more videos in the future. Thank you very much. You will see me in the future.